Hello, I'm Sebastian Michael, and this is this Saturday's sonnet. So am I as the rich, whose blessed key can bring him to his sweet uplocked treasure, the which he will not every hour survey, for blunting the fine point of seldom pleasure. Therefore are feasts so solemn and so rare, since seldom coming in the long year set, like stones of worth they thinly placed are, or captain jewels in the carcanet. So is the time that keeps you as my test, or as the wardrobe which the robe doth hide, to make some special instant special blessed by new unfolding his imprisoned pride. Blessed are you, whose worthiness gives scope, being had to triumph, being lacked to hope. And this is the extraordinary sonnet 52. I say it is extraordinary because it takes everything yet another step further. And in a way, that's what we want, isn't it? We kind of want this story to evolve and for things to go one step further now and then. And I think here we really, really have this. First of all, where and when is this taking place? Now, we know the poet has been away. We know I, Shakespeare, the poet, have been away from my young lover. And um, there has been a separation, which this time round felt a little bit different. The first time round, this was discussed in the former episode. And it is entirely possible um, to read this sonnet, as well as the other sonnets in this week's batch, as me, the poet, still being away. The words don't make it entirely clear that I am either away still or have returned back. I think, and this really is conjecture, the words themselves don't say either way, this is so or this isn't so. The words really do not give us a clear indication here and it is our approach to go by what the words are telling us. But it may be interesting and make the whole thing a little bit more poignant still and even more fascinating if we look at it in the context of where we are. And I find it particularly interesting and attractive. Sorry, I'm in the middle of a thunderstorm. You may hear a bit of thunder now then. To assume, to interpret this batch of sonnets as being written from a close proximity from uh, another reunion, from me, the poet, having got back together, having met up again, being reunited with my young lover, the young man. It could have been written either way. We don't know. But what makes me think that we are back together is partly this particular sonnet and also the ones around it, especially the next one, especially the one that comes after. I'm not going to read it for you now because I don't want to make these episodes too, too long and too uh, overloaded. But the next one, Sonnet 53, if you listen to it, if you read it, it sounds to me exactly like the kind of thing you would say to somebody or about somebody when you're lying next to them in the morning after the night before in the glow of the early morning light and you are in awe and wonder at how beautiful they are and and you can almost not make sense of their presence it's so tender and so close and so intimate and i would prefer if you like to read this as a sonnet that is written in the direct aftermath of actual togetherness of actually being together that's how i would read it uh, but it doesn't have to be read that way, it could be read any other way. But that's one of the reasons why I think we are back together. Also, because at the end of this particular batch, uh, when we get to number 56, there is yet another separation which would then begin again, which again then takes us on to the next stage of this relationship. And if we are still apart, then all of it is just simply kind of one arc. But there are several things that make me think we are back together at this particular point. Either way, whether or not the poet and the young man are together now, 
or whether the sonnet we're looking at 52 is about something that has happened in the past it is the most brazen in a way and categorical uh, declaration yet of what the nature of this relationship is. We've been talking about this several times now. Is it a real physical relationship? Is it a one-sided relationship? Is it wishful thinking on the part of the poet? Is it uh, requited love or is it unrequited love? We know it's very complex now because we know that the young man has effectively gone off with, seduced maybe, certainly had an, an affair with a mistress of mine, of Shakespeare's, if I'm the poet, if, if I'm Shakespeare, then, then my young lover has not only gone off with somebody else, uh, he's gone off with my mistress. So we know already it's complicated. We know there is a degree of trust that has been broken. And in this sonnet here, there's a whole new note that's being struck and a whole new uh, positioning within this relationship that is categorically different to anything we've heard before because you cannot say either in today's English or in the English of 400 and something years ago William Shakespeare's time Queen Elizabeth the first's time it is impossible to say to somebody blessed are you whose worthiness gives scope being had to triumph being lacked to hope without saying something really quite significant about the nature and I argue strongly the physical the sexual nature of your relationship that means sexual context does it not it cannot mean anything else you cannot say to a friend you do not say to a friend uh, be uh, if, if I have you I, 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 I triumph no friend would ever say that or would ever have said that it's not a friendly thing to say nor would you say that to a patron you would not say to a patron having you as my patron allows me to triumph that would be inconceivably arrogant and would probably lose your patron in a flash you can say it to a lover it's not necessarily a cooth Thing to say it's not necessarily a, a lovely a polite thing to say but that also means that then we're clearly beyond the stage of politeness it's been argued and I think rightly so that if you say something like this to somebody that means you are very very close to them but also you have a particular kind of relationship that allows you to play a game and this is what I think is now happening, which is why I think this is such a particularly interesting sonnet, because we are now no longer just in the game of love and chance and in the, oh, I love you, I love you, I pine for you, I, I want you, I want you, I find you beautiful, you're beautiful, you're beautiful, oh, aren't you lovely, 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 oh, aren't you worthy? We now say you are worthy and your worthiness gives scope being had, being had to triumph and being lacked to hope there is something going on here and this is also why incidentally I am so convinced that what's being played out here is not simply uh, a romantic uh, a romantic a kind of an idolized relationship it is to my mind a game of passion absolutely power certainly and also and i think here comes the evidence and also possession i cite this particular sonnet as evidence in making the case for arguing that what is being played out in these sonnets between me the poet william shakespeare and the young man whom we haven't named yet but we will at some point don't you worry that what is being played out here is a game and therefore yields itself for a play on passion, power and possession. So, what does it mean? Sonnet 52. So am I as the rich whose blessed key can bring him to his sweet uplocked treasure? So, therefore, so, or in that case, or then, 
Am I, as the rich, so am I like a rich person whose blessed key, whose who's blessed is, is just a good thing. It's just a, it, 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 it's a benevolent thing. This key is, a ble is blessed because it has the quality that's about to be described. It can, it can do these things. It's not a religiously blessed key necessarily, I don't think. But whose blessed key, whose kind, whose kind key, whose good key, whose, 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 whose precious key can bring him to his sweet uplocked treasure, to, his, uh, to, to the treasure that he has locked up. And remember, last only last week, we were talking about how I have locked everything away, but was not able to lock away you, and therefore was worried that you might be stolen from me. Now, I still, or again, invoke the image of an uplocked treasure, of a, of, a, of, a, of a precious thing that's been locked away. But now, looking forward to it, now I'm happy to be back, reunited with it, either or, either or. I particularly like the so here. You have to be careful here and you have to have good arguments for making a case. But here I find it interesting that we start with so, therefore, for this reason, then, then am I as the rich. Uh, we don't know what this refers to, but it could, it could refer to now that I'm back now that I have you again, now that I'm in front of you. It could. I'm not saying it does, because I can't prove it, and there's nothing in the words that says either way, but that could be one of the reasons for this. The which he will not every hour survey, this uplocked treasure, for blunting the fine point of seldom pleasure. This is human nature. If you have something that's, well, could be, uh, this, this can be human nature. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, that something that is really precious, you don't look at it all the time. If you have a very precious set of uh, china, we used to have this in our family, we had, a, we, had a, we had a special china set, which came out only on special occasions. You don't look at your special thing every day, every hour of every day, because that would blunt the pleasure, that would, that would make it trivial, that would make it normal, that would make it an everyday thing. The whole point of it being special is it's not everyday, it's special. Here, however, and I say this however not to contradict anything, but here on top of everything else, we also really, really want to draw attention a little bit to the choice of words. I have said before that Shakespeare chooses his words carefully, I mean this is a truism, of course he does, he's a poet. He's the greatest poet in the English language. Um, and he uses the words fine point of seldom pleasure. This can have all manner of connotations. And I'm not the only person who argues that these connotations here are of a sensual, of a sexual nature. And why shouldn't they be? Because, listen, Therefore are feasts so solemn and so rare, for this reason, for, for, for that precise same reason or for a similar reason, uh, feasts, special occasions, are so solemn, are ceremonious and serious, uh, and so rare and, 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 and so infrequent, since, because, seldom coming in the long year set, because seldom coming in the long year set, mm, we again have a word in there that doesn't necessarily have to be there, but it could be read in any number of ways. But anyway, seldom coming in the long year set means that they are not frequent. Um, and that the infrequency of them makes them special. That makes them like stones of worth. They thinly placed that are. So the, the, the big precious stones in a, in a necklace or in a carcanet, as is mentioned in a moment, the finest stones, they are thinly placed because they are the most precious ones and the less precious ones appear more often. Or captain jewels in the carcanet. The captain jewels are the chief jewels, the most important ones. So is the time, then we change, then, and then a new metaphor. So is the time that keeps you as my chest. So the time that keeps you, the time that has kept you away, or is keeping you now, whichever way you want to look at it, is like the chest, is as my chest. My chest, interesting, there's a double meaning there as well. There's, of course, the chest, the actual physical wooden chest. There's also the chest here, where the heart sits. As my chest, or as the wardrobe, which the robe doth hide. The time still is either like a chest, my chest specifically, or as the wardrobe, or it's also, it could also be compared to the wardrobe, which the robe doth hide, in which is hidden, in which is kept the robe. The robe being a special garment, the robe again being not a, not, not, not a, common, or, not, not a common or everyday thing that you wear, it's a special thing. 
to make some special instant, special blessed. So a special occasion becomes even more special through being able to put on this robe, through the dressing up, through, through uh, this garment being worn. By new unfolding his imprisoned pride. The imprisoned pride here obviously is again the robe. But pride, the imprisoned pride, which is now newly unfolded, can again have, and, and really I don't think I'm reading this into it, there are other editors who read this as well, be a sexual reference. It would make sense. It really would make sense, especially in view of what's next. Blessed are you whose worthiness gives scope, being had to triumph, being lacked to hope. You are blessed because you are so wonderful that to have you makes me triumph and to not have you still allows me to hope. We are about a third into our sonnets now and if you've been intrigued by and interested in these sonnets so far you have a treat in store for you because we are just about at the point now where if this were a Shakespearean drama we would be getting into Act 3, the middle act, which in a Hollywood film then is the middle act 2, but Hollywood films are structured in three acts so there it's Act 2. In Shakespearean drama we have five acts, so this is Act 3, it's the middle act, it's the act that has the heart and the soul and the meat of the story. And this is what's about to happen. We are about to get at the heart and soul and the meat of this story because our relationship between the poet and the young man has gone into a new territory has reached a new layer and that makes it even more interesting well up until now it was interesting because it was fascinating and a little bit incredible now we are really about to get into the complexities and the subtleties and the differentiations if you like and the interplay of two people who mean something to each other and who are not just going to let that go and I said just a moment ago I think what these sonnets are is the playing out of a game of passion power and possession and if we've been missing that up until now we won't be missing that for much longer we are now getting into the thick of it quite a bit and so of course that means that there are many many more and even more interesting even more intricate and even more fabulous sonnets to look at remember love is the power and see you next week